In 509 BC, following the overthrow of the tyrannical king, Tarquinius Superbus, the 200-year-old Eternal City formally became a republic. Electing to cast off the shackles of monarchy once and for all, a senatorial body representing the citizenry would take the place of a king, presiding over elections to various offices with a system of checks and balances. As this new form of government was continually adapting to threats to its existence, creating or enlodging offices to prevent the acquisition of too much power by a single senator, Alliances between families began to dominate and complicate the ideological goals originally set forth. Once again, the stage was set for the rise of an absolute authoritarian. But the battle against the evils of elite rule had ultimately led Rome down a six decades long path of civil wars. Caesar Augustus had resolved to bring an end to 60 years of Romans killing Romans. He found himself arbiter between the Senate, the people, and the military. The son of the divine Julius Caesar had ushered in a new golden era of peace, known as the Pax Romana. But peace came at a cost, and Caesar Augustus had been appointed Rome's accountant. So he began to tally the debits and credits in the ledger books of Rome. The first debit against continuing peace might be the problem of rivalry among Roman generals and politicians. Clearly, wars were instigated by some of the governors in the provinces and fought to victory on those battlefields, all with the goal of gaining accolades back in Rome, in the form of a triumph. And likewise, cunning senators who imagined themselves to be his proper replacement at the head of Rome's legions hatched plots against him under the guise of restoring the Republic. Competition, then, must be the culprit. He must eliminate competition, thereby accruing only credits to the ledger of Rome in the form of victories and honors for which he would hold the receipts. Even at the risk of being branded King of Rome, Caesar Augustus had stomped out every fledgling plot removing from their positions those generals and senators who had exploited their offices for personal advancement. And, as for triumphs, the princeps civitatus, or first among equals, whose very person had become synonymous with the majesty of Rome, had no choice but to take all the credit, awarding to the victorious generals the alternate honor of an ovation. In this way, Caesar Augustus was, of course, justified in turning the focus of triumphal victories away from arrogant generals and through himself, delivering them unto Rome. But what would happen after his death? Certainly, Rome would devolve into civil war once more, just as it had following the assassination of the dictator, Julius Caesar whose hold on power had also secured a temporary peace for Rome. Generals vying for control over the legions might disrupt the placement of power. The ensuing struggle might ignite division, each side laying claim to the moral high ground. And once some principled challenge was allowed to emerge, bloodshed was sure to follow. This could not happen. Augustus must make plans that confirmed the identity of his military and political successor. Having no son of his own, Augustus had followed the precedent set by his uncle, Julius Caesar, who also had no son of his own. As his uncle had undertaken to train him, so Augustus also began the military training of his own nephew, Marcellus. And, thinking to cover all bases, Augustus also went so far as to marry his daughter, Julia, to his nephew, Marcellus. But, if factions were to be prevented, the legions had to be pleased with Augustus's choice. The legions, however, were not pleased. They saw in Marcellus only the undeserving recipient of a prize that was hard won by their beloved commander, Marcus Agrippa. And so, Marcellus died of the plague. Next up, Augustus made Marcus Agrippa his equal, 
and the legions were pleased, especially when Augustus's widowed daughter, Julia, remarried their favored Agrippa, giving him two sons, Gaius and Lucius. After adopting both his new grandsons and bestowing on them the divine name of Caesar, the succession was finally settled. Surely, the legions could get behind the peaceful transfer of power to the sons of Agrippa. And in granting Agrippa the tribunician powers, Caesar Augustus was also honoring the republican tradition of shared offices, not unlike that of consul or censor. In concert with Marcus Agrippa, Augustus could now steer the ship of Rome in the direction of peace and unity, while simultaneously safeguarding his own powers. This dual office could now be passed on to his grandsons when they came of age. But, given their present lack of experience, it would be many years before Gaius and Lucius could realistically command Rome's legions. An alternate pair was needed to guide the ship in the interim. And so, Caesar Augustus promoted the military careers of his Claudian stepsons, Tiberius and Drusus. Tiberius did well, retrieving Rome's missing standards from Armenia, assisting in the annexation of Noricum, and defeating tribes along the Danuvius River and in the Alps. But, in the conquest of Germania, Drusus had been an overachiever, covering himself in so much glory that his legions began to glorify him, and his out of step with Augustan political ideals. This younger son of Augustus's wife had made no secret of his animosity towards one man rule in Rome, even if that man was his own stepfather. Then, Drusus died of gangrene. The death of Drusus had come close on the heels of Agrippa's death, forcing Caesar Augustus to reinvent his succession plans. Tiberius must be immediately promoted to not only fill Agrippa's vacant position, but to marry Agrippa's widow as well. As the new stepfather of the sons of Agrippa, Augustus expected Tiberius to promote the military and political educations of Gaius and Lucius. But, Tiberius ruined Augustus's plans by suddenly retiring from public life. It was the novel election of Augustus's 14-year-old grandson, Gaius Caesar, to the 6 BC consulship which had most deeply offended Tiberius. By electing Gaius to the highest office in government, and by embarking on a smear campaign designed to see Tiberius removed as protector of Julia's children, the Roman people had let their sentiments be known. Rome wanted the torch of rule to pass to Augustus's grandson, but the Roman people did not trust Augustus's stepson Tiberius to cooperate, especially when doing so meant diminishing the prospects for his own biological son, Drusus, Caesar Augustus tried everything to block the retirement of Tiberius. He thought to ease tensions by postponing his 14-year-old grandson's consular appointment to the age of 20. But Tiberius had already begun his dramatic hunger strike, leading Augustus to accuse Tiberius of acting on behalf of his son, Drusus. Tiberius answered the allegation by opening his last will and testament revealing to his doubting stepfather that Gaius and Lucius Caesar were named therein as his primary benefactors. With a Parthian uprising once again on the horizon, Caesar further attempted to delay the retirement of Tiberius by sending him to Armenia. But Tiberius, in possession of the tribunician powers, deployed his former brother-in-law, Publius Quinctilius Verus, in his stead. Finally, Caesar Augustus became ill. Still, Tiberius did not return to Rome, choosing to wait in Ostia's harbor for word of his stepfather's recovery. Undaunted, Tiberius held his ground, and Caesar Augustus had no choice but to fast-track the advancement of his juvenile grandson, Gaius Caesar. At the age of 15, Gaius became a senator, the teenager was also given a priesthood in the College of Pontiffs, 
and appointed leader of Rome's youth. But, the ongoing absence of Tiberius left a glaring time gap between the generation of Augustus and that of his grandson that was too significant to be ignored. What had happened? How had so many people come together to unanimously elect a child to govern? Someone had masterminded this political coup in an all-out effort to force the hand of Caesar Augustus. But who? The answer finally presented itself through an unexpected source. When just a few years after demanding permission to retire to Rhodes, Tiberius suddenly began writing impassioned letters to his stepfather, Augustus, insinuating he was in danger and requesting he be recalled to Rome. Believing Tiberius to be over-dramatizing his change of heart, Augustus refused. With each passing year bringing Gaius closer to adulthood, Augustus's need for his stepson was shrinking. Tiberius could just stay put. But when the wife of Augustus, Livia Drusilla, placed irrefutable proof before her husband, proof that her son's life was in fact in danger, Augustus was forced to listen. Through her daughter-in-law, the widow, Antonia Drusa, Livia had learned of a plot to assassinate her son Tiberius, architected by none other than Antonia's own half-brother, Eulus Antonius, the last surviving son of Marcus Antonius. And in the heart of the plot beat the complicity of Julia, Augusti Philia, the mother of Gaius and Lucius, and the unpredictably wayward daughter of Caesar, Augustus, 